Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Dan Malthrop. I'm the CEO here at the City Club of Cleveland. It gives me great pleasure to introduce our program today, a conversation with Cuyahoga County's sole Republican candidate for county executive with Plain Dealer columnist and the host of Sound of Ideas on 90.3 Ideas Stream, Mike McIntyre, as our moderator. It is in the tradition of the City Club of Cleveland to provide all the information the community needs to make informed decisions. Yesterday, we hosted a lively conversation about issue seven, the proposed extension of the excise tax on alcohol and tobacco. Next week, we will host a debate among all six candidates in the Democratic primary for county executive. In Cuyahoga County, a predominantly Democratic county, as you all know, we wanted to make sure the Republican Party and the Republican candidate had a voice in the ongoing discourse about the future of Cuyahoga County. And so today we have an opportunity for that Republican candidate to share his ideas and voice his opinions as all of us begin to think about what we're looking for in the next county executive. I'll let Mike introduce our candidate, County Councilman Jack Schron. A brief introduction to Mike McIntyre, though, for those of you who live under a rock and don't know him. <laughs> Mike McIntyre is a columnist for The Plain Dealer and Cleveland.com. In 2010, he took over as host of The Sound of Ideas on 90.3 WCPN FM Idea Stream, and he's also a very good friend of mine. Gives me great pleasure. Please join me in welcoming Mike McIntyre and Jack Schron. Thank you. <clears throat> took over as host from whom? Dan Maltrop, ladies and gentlemen. So I suppose I'll be working at the City Club in three years. <laughs> Uh, let me introduce you to the man sitting to my left, Jack Schron. Jack has lived in Cuyahoga County almost all of his life. Those of you who know him know that. He returned to the county more than 30 years ago following his military service. He was reelected to a four-year county council term beginning in 2013. He was on the inaugural county council as well. His stated priorities are job creation and rebuilding the credibility of Cuyahoga County government. We'll talk a little bit about that during this conversation. Mr. Schron has led Jurgens Incorporated as president and CEO for nearly 30 years, co-founded an internet education business called Tooling University. He served 28 years in the United States Army, retiring as a lieutenant colonel. He's a 1966 graduate of Chagrin Falls High School, local guy. Mr. Schron received his Bachelor of Science in 1970 from Florida Southern College and a JD from Ohio Northern University in 1975. Mr. Schron is married, his wife Mary Ellen, and he married in 1970. He has three adult sons, four grandchildren. Two of the three adult sons are living in Northeast Ohio. You missed one. We're working on it. You're working on it. Ladies and gentlemen, Jack Schron. I get this one all the time. Um, I really love your hand lotions. Well, <laughs> you can thank the team over here for putting them on all the time. So. <laughs> So Jurgens is not the hand lotion company? We're not the hand lotion company, no. We make uh, machine tool parts, and we make the most sophisticated electric screwdriver in the world. Hmm. Can I buy that on late night television? You can, but it's about $7,000 a screwdriver. <laughs> okay. So we, we'd, we'd love for you to buy as many as you want. Is that shipping and handling as well? Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll personally deliver it to you. <laughs> Let me start with um, uh, my first question, actually using the words of Brent Larkin, who wrote a column in The Plain Dealer about you. Uh, here's what Brent wrote. He said, when the GOP last won a countywide office, LeBron James was in third grade, Bernie Kosar was the Browns quarterback, Mike White was in his first term as mayor, and Ed Fitzgerald was in law school. It's been a long time, more than two decades, since that has happened, since the Republican has taken a countywide office. Why do you think the environment is right now? So it's about time for us to change that, <laughs> those, those numbers, I, I would agree. Uh, I think that the time is right because I think you, you have to look at it and say, and I personally look at it and say, is the job done? And I think that we can all look at it and say, no, you can, there's a whole f bunch of folks over here from the Charter Review Commission uh, that will acknowledge the job is not done. Uh, do we have things to do? Absolutely. Do I believe that uh, I fit the mold of what they're looking for? When you wrote the charter, they're looking for a county executive. I spent 30 years as an ex executive. I spent 28 years as an officer in the United States Army. I developed, uh, with, uh, I co-developed the world's first internet uh, business for manufacturing, and I spent the last four years understanding county government from the inside. I think people are ready this year to finally say, it's a year in which we look at a person, not a party. 
and why shouldn't it be this year in Cuyahoga County? So I stand ready to do that, uh, and I think that people in this county are finally ready to wake up and say, hey, let's suddenly finish the job, let's go forward, let's build on the foundations of the first four years, and let me go forward and be that leader. I think I can make the difference. Would you prefer to erase the D or the R after the candidate's name? I think it's a, that's a fantastic question. Uh, not only do I think that, I actually proposed that uh, when we had conversations from the uh, Charter Review Commission. I think that if you look at the 59 communities in Northeastern Ohio, you only vote D or R for a position of this nature and I think three of the 59. So when you think about it, in your municipality, in your school district, in your community, you don't vote D or R. Why shouldn't it be that way in the most important office in Cuyahoga County? The Democrats are going to be here, as Dan Mothrop said, next week. I think there's like 64 candidates for county executive. <laughs> Uh, and they'll be here, they're going to build a much bigger stage, reinforce it. Um, <laughs> but I wonder what they should be talking about. We'll talk about some of your issues here, but looking at that, looking forward at that discussion, what should those Democrats be addressing and what won't they address in your view? Well, what they won't address is they won't address the fact that you're asking them to be the executive and a leader. Uh, with experience of having been a manufacturing leader or a leader of a business or an entrepreneur that started something. So what they won't be able to talk about, they'll be able to talk about politics and how their experience in those areas. What I don't think they'll be able to talk about is 30 years of leadership, 28 years in the Army, having driven bus business decisions, having been on the inside of county government for these first four years. So I don't know what they're going to talk about, but I do believe they won't be able to talk about any of those things. You've run Jurgens, and you've mentioned it, and the, I think here at the table of your colleagues here from that company. So you do have experience as somebody that runs a business. And there are some people that say government should run more like a business. There's another line of thinking that is government is nothing like a business. It doesn't have a profit motive. It's there to serve the electorate and the citizenry. So you're in business and you're in government. Which is it? I think what you are is you're in the, the service of an individual. And that individual, whether or not that individual is receiving services from the government or that individual is serv receiving services from a corporation, if you take that, almost that Disney-esque attitude, and you can sense it when you go to an organization that has a desire to serve uh, and to be part of, uh, of that, I don't think that you have to create a, a hard-line delineation that says this person did this their, in their entire career and this person did that. If you have the objective of serving people and doing that from the heart and having it with a passion, I think that a business person can very effectively move into this role. And I've been doing it for the last four years. One of the things you didn't have listed on there, uh, on that mic, was I also spent 12 years on the Chagrin Falls Board of Education. When we came on board, we had about four AP classes. By the time we left, we had 28 because service was critical to our students. So that discussion that it should be more like a business. Are there areas where you think county government should operate more like a traditional business and are there places where that really can't happen? Well, I think that one of the things that you've got to look at, and, and I got, I've got this problem, I guess, or this, uh, this element of me that says that I'm not afraid of taking on a hard issue. I'm not afraid to challenge it, to analyze it, to put it together, to work with a team, to build a solution, and then ultimately uh, put that in place. And I, I guess just as a little minor example, uh, if anybody is a, a native Clevelander, you know something about the Conwood Railroad Yards uh, that's had abandoned for almost 20 years. We looked at it as a team. Ultimately, somebody had to make the decision, we're going to clean up that worst brownfield. We did it. We built it. We put our building there. Uh, but that, the core part of that is we put people to work, and they're, they're now part of, of, of an element of service out there. And today, 50 acres that sat abandoned now has an entire workforce of people across that entire uh, area between Juergens, Food Bank, Cleveland Clinic. Uh, so I think that you can make those transitions. I think it's, it's, it is very viable to take the best of, of, uh, of one principle and bring it forward. Uh, we started when we created the charter, and we passed a charter, we passed a reform, but we haven't finished the reorganization. And as we get further, I'd like to be able to talk about that so you can start to bring some of those business principles 
and the human principles together in a single service. Well, now's the greatest time as any. You, you said when you made your announcement, uh, the quote was, I believe together we can finish the reform of county government. And I wonder, in your view, what is unfinished? Well, I think what we, we started, and, we, we, and there's no question that um, there's 11 of us on the county council, and I, I, I think that we've done a great job uh, personally of eliminating that R&D uh, element. We, we talk as a group, we're collegial. So that piece of the reform, I think, has moved forward from what the, the people have put the, the charter together and said we need to be a, a broad base. We work well with the, the, the current county executive, but uh, we only have started on the process. Uh, if you look at it, uh, the Charter Review Commission came through with a, a, a number of suggestions, and this, this body over here worked diligently uh, we, of the, of the list of items they put forth, only four made it to the ballot. So I would dare say that they probably think we have not quite finished the project either. Uh, and I see a lot of heads nodding over from the county, uh, the Charter Review Commission. And I mean, we can talk about specifics on it. And, and that is uh, one of the questions I was asked by the, by the plane dealer in, in I think in, in the ref, uh, question and answer period, we were asked, uh, is corruption gone in the county? And my answer to that is that you have to ask the FBI because they are the professionals that are doing that part. Is the risk of corruption gone? And the answer to that is we can never, ever assume that it'll be gone forever. We must be diligent, we must work hard, and when suggestions come forward to create an independent inspector general, to have the watchdog, to have the people out there being the eyes and ears of complete independence, that's the, some of the stuff that is really unfinished. They also suggested that the sheriff uh, should be an independent body, that they should not be um, one in which you can fire an investigative person without uh, some background and checks. Uh, and I think the suggestion was that you have to have a supermajority from the council along, I think you had to have a supermajority that hit eight out of the 11. Um, I think great ideas. So when I say it's not done, we're started. We're moving down the right direction. A lot, of way, lot, of, lot more room to go. Uh, and I do, I guess I, you're not supposed to make commitments uh, and this kind of stuff, you're supposed to just kind of be a little wishy-washy, but I'm committing that I'll be here for eight years uh, if, uh, if elected and re-elected because I think it's the job that needs an eight-year commitment. Is, is, that a, uh, is that a direct criticism of your of the county executive now who has decided to run for, uh, for governor? It's not a criticism because I think that if you if you look at where we are, we, he's started, we've, and the county executive has moved us along in, in uh, the proper context, but I think the job is not finished. And as uh, uh, just by, just as, as another just example, uh, we were throwing a problem, uh, and anybody who's in industry knows that there's, uh, there's conversations about a skills labor problem. Now, how do you get the workforce? Um, where do you go? Where do you find the bodies? Where do you find the people? Where do you find people like to do some things like, you know, welding? And so we looked at a problem. Together as a team, we created what we call Tooling University that you referenced. We were told it wouldn't work. The investment community, unfortunately, said uh, it's not something we want to go into. And we just rejected that uh, because we thought that the job was not finished of putting together a workforce until you've trained that workforce. By the way, 250,000 students went to Tooling U last year. Uh, Ed Fitzgerald says he's flattered to know that Republicans think he should run for another term as county executive. Uh, I, the, one of the things that I, I think yeah, that makes me uh, hopefully somewhat different is I believe that everybody in this audience, everybody listening to this, is looking for honesty in government. And I think that continuity was so important to where we started as a structure. We don't have the continuity, so at this point in time, I'm going to try and bring that leadership in place. Uh, you've been for spending on some of the big ticket items uh, in downtown Cleveland, the Convention Center, the Convention Center Hotel, uh, to name just a couple, the new county administration building. Um, that's where you're on the same page, really, as Democrats in the county in regards to, uh, to those projects. And I wonder, that's usually not, it's usually not the government spending on big projects Republican thing. It's usually the other way around. I wonder if you can explain how you jibe with them on this and how you justify those investments. I'd like to say that they're on the same page as I am. Okay. okay. 
<laughs> Fair enough. When, uh, when, when we looked at the county office building concept, let's just take that one for example, uh, only because I knew when we looked at Juergens' headquarter building, we looked at, let's face it, Lake County. We have offices in Chicago. We looked in Cook County. We looked all around the globe and decided we we're going to plant our stake in Cuyahoga County. And I knew what it took to analyze that ultimately to fit a building and a program and a process into somebody else's building, it just doesn't work. So I, I actually was the advocate for putting it into the new building because we're a new county, we're a new government, we're a new attitude, and the only way you get the new programs to work, I believe, is to put them effectively into a new venue. And actually, we heard uh, our director of HR yesterday was asking for reconfirmation. Her very words were, the new building will actually change the morale and attitude as the people move into it. So yes, I was a, a, an advocate for that. The, the uh, convention center, we are on the cusp of doing phenomenal things here in, in this county. We're at the risk, I believe, without leadership that's actually led in an executive role of going the wrong way. But the convention center was one of the key components to putting that together and making it happen. We have a medical community that is second to none in the world. So you link a convention center with the medical community, and now we are driving one of our three main components of Northeast Ohio. There's two more, which I'll talk about later on. But uh, the two main components, you've now linked a convention center, a reason to come to Cleveland. You now have a medical reason to come and see because we have all of the medical devices being manufactured in here. And so, yes, I am in favor of both those. And I don't know that you asked about the hotel, but the reason the hotel, I'm in favor of that, is that completes the package because now a convention has a reason to come here to have the convention hotel directly connected with our convention center, with our medical mart, and all those are all uh, one big solution, I think. And you can see the excitement uh, people are talking about. I think I, somebody was just referencing the fact that I think the New York Times had an article about Cleveland and its comeback. We used to be off the radar screen. I think we're now being thought of as in the top 15. We're going to be the top five in eight years. I would think that the, many of the Democrats who will be speaking next week would say the same thing about those projects, that they have the same passion for them and think that they're important. Linking uh, the convention center and the medical business, having the hotel, those types of things. So I wonder how you can distinguish yourself. What, what makes what you say about those things different than what they say or what you'll do different than what they'll do? I guess the one question I'd ask is next week, if you're in the audience, because they know you're the moderator next week, is there'll be six of them up here and ask all of them, have they ever placed a convention in a convention center and a convention hotel? I can tell you that three years ago when this was only on the drawing boards, I sat as the president of the Industrial Supply Association, the largest supply company in the entire world making the cutting tools, the machine parts, all the things that make that together. And I asked our board of directors, Cleveland should be our next convention following San Diego and New Orleans. After you get the chuckle and you get past that piece, which always takes place at any board, when you initially bring up a suggestion like that, you then tell them, have you seen our Rock and Roll Hall of Fame? Have you been part of our new casino? Have you touched our theater district? Have you been part of that? So ask them next week whether they can actually say that they know what it takes to place a, con a, a convention, all the pieces and parts, why the integration of all the things that we're talking about, all the back office, all the pieces of hospitality and hotel, and why a convention center hotel is critical because of the room blocks and all the other things that take place. So I would suggest that it does differentiate. They might be able to say they are a cheerleader for them. I've been a participant. Beyond those particular issues, I'm really interested in finding out the difference between you and whoever the presumed Democratic candidate would be. So take us forward to after the election. If you were to win, how will, how will the next four years be different than if a Democrat wins the county executive role? I think that uh, what, you, uh, what you have to look at there is uh, we've got uh, your, as the CEO, it's your responsibility, and I refer to that because I think you are, the, uh, as the, the, the chief executive officer, you are the face for this, this county. And that's the face not only of the Republicans 
and the Democrats and the independents and those who choose not to vote. And you have to look at those six faces and this face and say, okay, who's sold something? Who's actually moved products? Who's moved ideas and objectives and goals? So I, I really think that I'm going to differentiate as far as an executive and a leader uh, because of the fact that I've, I, I bring that experience to the table. Uh, they, they will bring in years of, uh, of public service as a representative or a senator or uh, somebody else doing public service, but ask them whether they've actually had to make a budget, run, a, run an organization. We're talking about 6,000 employees. We're talking about $1.3 billion budget. And we're talking about uh, uh, so many moving parts. And the question is, have they ever touched those kind of moving parts on the other side? Some of the things we've talked about are ideas that Ed Fitzgerald has been behind as well and has supported. Uh, what about some of Ed Fitzgerald's other ideas that he's laid out and that uh, have been discussed by council as well? Will you continue uh, the, the pre-K program, the universal pre-K program? Will you, will you continue a college savings account idea that he has put forward? What, what, what ideas has he, ha have he, has he had that you'll continue and which ones do you think shouldn't go forward? Well, I think what you have to do is you have to look at what the transition is and what was the objective when those ideas perhaps were put forward and what's the objective going forward with those same ideas. Uh, let's just take the, the scholar, uh, the $100 scholarship uh, of which the county committed $2 million of which 500000 was just in the administration to set, the, set this up. Um, and the first student that's going to utilize the benefit of this will be 13 years from now. Will I go back and say, okay, what was, what's the objective here? What are we trying to do? Are we trying to encourage um, student participation, savings accounts? And I will ask the questions, is this the right tool? So I will not, uh, I will not say that, it, uh, that something was put in place is forever going to stay there just because of previous administration. I think that's, that's the fault of, of all government, that, that, uh, that if, once a pro program gets in place, it never can, can be questioned. Well, I think we should question everything. We should question every dollar because the people in this room and the people that are, uh, that are not uh, in here but are listening to it or are going to see it, those are their tax, tax dollars, and it's our job to spend them efficiently. So I want to ask those questions out there. Uh, I don't think that... I should sit here and say this one should be excluded, this should be included, but could things like um, uh, using our state or the organized plan that we have for college education uh, be a better tool perhaps for a student that's maybe a sophomore, junior, senior in high school to get them immediate use of that same $2 million? I don't know. Those are, those are the kind of questions I think need to be asked. Uh, to sit here and say this is good, this is bad, I should exclude it, I think that's not being fair to, to the analysis. What about um, the issue of Medicaid expansion in Ohio? The state is doing it. The governor has said so. Many people in his party uh, not in favor of that. You'd be the leader of what is now still the biggest county in Ohio, a very powerful seat. Uh, what would you do about, uh, about that issue? Well, of course, one of the, the biggest uh, beneficiaries of that is Metro General Hospital and those funds going through. And so at this point in time, uh, I think that uh, we need to make sure that uh, those funds are properly administered. Uh, they do have a sunset to them. Uh, they're they're going to sunset down to 90% in a few years. Uh, and, we, uh, and there's no guarantee as to what's going to happen to fill the gap after that point in time. So I think that as a as the county executive uh, and with the uh, support to Metro that we do, we, we provide uh, another $5 million just recently and $35 million. We need to make sure that those funds are, are being effectively used. The governor has decided, uh, and uh, uh, it has been put forth uh, in a legal format, so those funds are going to flow to us, and it's our job to make sure we use them effectively. Did you agree with his decision? Uh, I, I did not agree with the decision per se, but uh, like a lot of decisions, I don't agree with, with all the decisions that, are, that come out, but it's my job uh, to implement it and carry it forward if I was the county executive in regards to that. I'm curious to know what your, what your thoughts were on that. If, if you weren't for the state's expansion of Medicaid, what, what's behind that thinking? Well, I, would ju I was uh, concerned about the federal government sometimes starts programs, and they start you down a path, and they put funds in your pocket, only to find out that the funds erode in, in uh, you are still having the responsibility to fill that gap at a later time uh, because you've now extended the benefits and the benefits are not covered by the fact that there's no longer funds uh, to support that. 
So that was my that was my concern uh, is the longevity of the commitment from the current administration in Washington versus what would happen uh, down the road. You uh, you would have, as I mentioned, a, a pretty important job as a county executive and one that has some stature in the state, uh, not just on this issue but on others. How would you envision using that? position in Columbus to influence policy? I think the way you use that, that, that position is you go to Columbus and say, this is the most populated county. This is the most important county as far as driving dollars and taxes down there. We should have our voice on every one of these issues, whether or not it's something of what we're talking about here. It's how we develop economic development. Uh, and again, that is a role that I, that, uh, I would be very comfortable playing uh, because I think that that's part of the selling of why we need to have the film credit for things like uh, uh, the uh, Winter Soldier and Captain America that opened last night. And it's Which you saw. I did see that, yes. This is the one fact. guy in the room that's seen the Winter Soldier. Oh, right. oh, oh. <laughs> sorry about that. The count, uh, we can it's all a great see it movie. Friday. Buy a ticket on Friday when it comes out public. That's right. Uh, but it was, it's, uh, it's a fantastic movie. Uh, but it would not have taken place without Ivan Schwartz going out and going down to Columbus and saying, we want to be an advocate for the Cleveland Film Commission. We want to tell you why it's important. And by the way, that's a, I love the segue because it's the second M of where we're going. I believe that there's medical, manufacturing, and media. And this is exactly, when I say media, the films, the arts, the theater, uh, our museums. All of that is that structure that we need to go down to Columbus and make sure they know we are a dynamic county and we're leading this area out there for that third M of media because not only does Winter Soldier get shown here and we had 900 new employees that were never employed but for that movie, there was all of the hospitality, all the food service, all the vehicles that transported people, all those things that came into that whole envelope and as, uh, as we're talking about now, it will be to, to go down to Columbus and say, We've had these successes, and next week there's going to be game day is going to be launched. We've had these successes draft with this day. part. Or draft day, game day, right. that's right. It's, you can tell I was never a football <laughs> player. I was a wrestler. Yeah, so. Uh, <laughs> uh, so you have these successes out there, and we need to go down and tell them we need the permanent infrastructure to support that, and we need to be part of this a total package and be selling this. Uh, uh, and Cuyahoga County is in the best position to sell that, I really think. We talked about the wrestling earlier. I'm a wrestler too, but I'm a little out of your weight class now. <laughs> we'll uh, shoot takedowns at the break. Too. <laughs> he still took the challenge. <laughs> um, you mentioned the three M's, manufacturing, media, and I'm assuming the third, I want to make sure we get all three. I'm assuming it's not McIntyre. It's, it, it could have been, but it was going to be medical. The third it's M right. is medical. Okay, so ma manufacturing, which you have covered as, uh, as running a manufacturing company. The medical you've talked. I just want to make sure you got a chance to talk about those three M's. Okay, well, I think that if you look at our three drivers uh, in here, and no deference to the, the law firms that are here because their support, the accounting support, the financial support, but we need to have the big drivers of, uh, of the community. And, and certainly we know that between Cleveland Clinic and UH, those are the single two largest employers, but the single largest employment community is still manufacturing. People sometimes think that it's dead. I can tell you that uh, we just opened a brand new office in, in China uh, on last weekend I was uh, when I was there in Shanghai on Sunday and the manufacturing community is not only alive and well it's going off the charts and our office there is strictly to sell what we ship to them every Friday from Cleveland the media community is one in which sometimes you look out and you see all the, you see the young people in the audience here and you know we need to have that spark that excitement that th thrill for why uh, you want to be in Cuyahoga County and, uh, and, and one of the studies that I looked at the other day was young people pick where they're going to live before they have a job. Now, my generation, yeah, they have a job, and you, you, you went through the job, but uh, having a son that we're trying to get back from Charlotte, I know that that's, the, uh, in fact, the case. But the media means that we have the, the, all that money that came through on Winter Soldier, all the money that came through on this, but you also look at, uh, at the, the Cleveland Institute of Art, I just saw the numbers as far as the, the drivers of jobs and the economic development that that drives. The orchestra, world famous, but uh, these hotels we're building, great areas for hospitality. Uh, our culinary school over at uh, Tri-C, they envision that they're going to be up there at the school of 
Johnson and Wales, uh, the uh, the food schools out in California, and someday they're going to be up that same level. So uh, these are all the secondary jobs that come through from that third media, and it's a place that the young people get excited about. Uh, they get excited about the digitalization. Uh, they know that it's it's part of their. There's no reason for the kids to graduate from Cleveland Institute of Art and go out to California to do gaming. There's no reason for them to leave here and be doing their digitizing, and that's what Ivan Schwartz is talking about. Let's build that next level. We've had success at this level. Now let's build the infrastructure. You've been listening to a conversation with Jack Schron. He's a candidate for county executive, the Republican. I think you're going to win the Republican nomination, are you not? I was going to go on the road, <laughs> go on the limit and say, I think I've got the Republican nomination. As he is the only candidate at this moment. And there will be a, uh, uh, a general election as well. Uh, next week, uh, I wanted to do a little bit, bit of housekeeping and let you know that next week there's a discussion with uh, the Democratic candidates as well right here at the City Club. Uh, we welcome all of you here and those joining us via our live webcast which is supported by the University of Akron. This Friday, April 4th, the City Club welcomes David Kerp, professor, author of Improbable Scholars, The Rebirth of a Great American School System and a Strategy for America's Schools. For more information about upcoming and past programs, visit cityclub.org. You can find out information about next week's program as well. And we do welcome guests today at tables hosted by Friends of Jack Schron, by Jurgens. Patrick McLaughlin and the Republican Party of Cuyahoga County. Thank you all for your support. Today's program is sponsored by the Northeast Ohio Media Group, the City Club's official sponsor of politics and policy programming. The City Club thanks you for your support. And now we're going to return to our speaker for our traditional City Club question and answer period. This is not an incredibly well populated event today. A lot of uh, folks that you know are here and there are a number of tables sold, but you usually see a slightly bigger crowd if there's, for example, when we have the 72 Democratic candidates next week, there will be a slightly bigger crowd. So I want to implore each and every person here to ask a question if you have one. I hope you've developed it. If you don't, I know about 11 of you, maybe 14 of you by name, and I will call you <laughs> by name, starting with Dan Multhrop. <laughs> Uh, holding the microphone today, by the way, is, uh, is oh, Carrie, Carrie's there. Carrie Miller is uh, the City Club Program Director, so make sure you get her attention so that we can hear your question. And one admonition there, do frame it in the form of a question. It's got a big question mark at the end of it. You kind of rise your voice at the end. That's what a question sounds like. <laughs> so that's what we're looking for, questions, okay? And let's start with the first here, Mr. Akers. <coughs> Jack. Uh, curious to have you, I think none of us who know you and watched you can answer our own this question, but what you, from your own words, what do you consider the three, four, five most significant accomplishments that you have achieved in your four years as a county councilman? Well, I, I, I'll, I'll go back to what I think we, need, we as a group needed to, to accomplish right off the bat, and that was to set that honesty and integrity piece uh, because that clock, we, we need to set that compass back on, on the right direction, and I think we've done that. Uh, it's, it, anybody that uh, has ever seen an organizational transitional structure knows that that's not an easy thing to do. We, we, we very easily could have the wheels come off the cart. We could have gone into a bipartisan fight and bickering. None of us let that happen. And so that, I, I know that's not one in which it scores a lot of points because you say you, you have a checklist of something you did, but that's actually one of the hardest things to do. And I, and I really believe that's probably one of the hardest things we have to go forward on is those, those what look like soft tasks, but the reorganizational tasks are really tough ones to go forward. Um, I'll try and get to, I'll get to two more just in the interest of, of other time. Uh, I was the, the, the chairperson of uh, the Economic Development Committee, uh, which I consider to be the most important committee in Cuyahoga County as far as the, the responsibility. Because if you look at the charter, Three of the six preambles all talk about economic development and job creation. When you went, and I, I see all the charter folks already nodding because they know the preamble back and forth. They probably know it. Uh, but uh, what that meant as far as chairing economic development meant the responsibility to, to make sure these drafted documents, these very early stages where we had nothing on paper, uh, had to be in place. Well, the county had no um, functional ways of uh, of building property and using the techniques that you'd see today that are every place else. Design build, construction manager at risk, all the things that you see as techniques that we use in, in the private sector didn't exist in, in the public sector. 
So that was a piece of legislation that uh, I personally drove. Uh, we had work with, I see Bob Strickler was here before from uh, uh, the uh, uh, construction uh, industry out there. All, we all work together. We work with, I work with labor unions on it to make sure that the construction labor unions bought into it and understood where we're going. So now we have those tools, even though the uh, uh, specific uh, convention center was not used, we use those exact tools, the legislation wasn't in place, but because we, we had an exemption, it came in. It allows you to build buildings on time, under budget, and that's how we're building uh, the new convention hotel. Uh, we'll be using these, uh, these, these techniques of design build out there, which means that you can have uh, things done faster, at a lower cost and more efficiently. And then the, the third one is, is one in which um, uh, the Kearney County Executive, he, he pushed this uh, over and I thought it was a good idea. And what he calls his $100 million fund, uh, it's now been turned into the Western Reserve Fund. The idea was, here, let's put forth uh, dollars to go out to stimulate business. Loved the idea, thought it was a great, uh, great concept, but it lacked any of the meat and bones that needed to be on it. Uh, and I said, I'm sorry, I can't support it in this condition. Because as a business owner, you want to know what are you being scored on, what's the objectives, how do I uh, successfully compete against somebody else bidding for these same dollars. So what we did is we built jobs in, performance, financial status, all of these things that you would expect from a business, business proposal. Uh, it was initially said, oh, this is going to slow it down. It's going to bog down the process. It's going to, going to make it cumbersome. And within six months, the same folks that, uh, from the executive's office were saying, no, this actually made it better. All of our applicants understood where they're coming from. They understood how they're being scored. And so I consider those uh, to be uh, three of the best uh, examples of what, what, I, uh, what I've done uh, in regards to it. Before we take the next question, I mentioned something about the size of the crowd. Uh, and I wonder if you have any thoughts about uh, the folks who aren't here. The idea that you're running for the most important, arguably the most important, political office regionally and one of the most important in the state. And I think you've made this point before, sort of listen to the other side, even if you, you don't identify with that politically. And I wonder what your thoughts are about the size of the crowd. Well, I'm, I'm certainly thrilled with everybody that's in the room. Right. Uh, they, no they offense. Took this time. Yeah. And I, I really appreciate and thank everybody for coming today. Uh, but I wish that, uh, that, that the dialogue was, uh, was all encompassing because that's how we as a society, if we hear both sides of the aisle, we hear both points of view, we hear all, uh, all of it, then we can make a decision intelligently. And uh, it's kind of sad uh, that we haven't gotten to this point. And by the way, I, uh, when somebody said, when are you ready for a debate? I'm ready for a debate on Wednesday uh, after the primary. Uh, just tell me when we want to go because I'm, I'll be ready to, to be prepared and, and work uh, for that. So uh, I'm disappointed that there aren't more different points of view uh, here. I wish that we had room full of, uh, of folks on all sides uh, because my objective is probably to convince them that I should be the county executive. Hopefully the folks in the room, an awful lot of them are, 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 are believers at this point. Uh, but those who are not in the room, if we talk to them and say, this is a year that we want somebody who is an executive. This is a year in which we want somebody to accomplish and be a, somebody who takes on the tough tasks and finishes it. Uh, I'd love to be able to present that message to everybody. And the folks at the City Club assure me that uh, there will be that kind of dialogue as we approach the general election. Next question, sir. My name is Attorney Joseph Patrick Meisner, and I'm a lifelong Democrat backing Jack. Uh, my question is that when I grew up, our city had almost a million people, and we were one of the strongest regions in the world. Today, that's not so true. My question to you is this, and I think you've already given some answers to this in your talk. How can we attract more people, keep our young people here in Cleveland and in the region, attract more companies, and especially attract people from not only around in America, but from other countries to settle here. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Meiser. I, I appreciate that. And I didn't realize that you were, uh, you were backing Jack. And I, I thank you very much for that uh, commitment today. That's, uh, that's fantastic. It's the best news I've heard today. So uh, says so on a giant sticker on uh, Well, it does say that. Right well, he, he had to put it on. But he also had, he didn't have to make that statement. So I really appreciate that. The, uh, uh, the um, objectives here is how do you get the young people to be here? That's part of it. And I think that that young people bring a sense of excitement and enthusiasm. But I think under a Jack Schron administration, we will also uh, be part of all those other parts of the community uh, that need to be, be successful too. And that's the way we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna build this back in, the, our downtown area. 
Uh, one of the ways is I think that third M is an area that gets excitement to, to young people. Uh, but so, some of the easy ways. Anybody ridden an airplane in the last uh, six months? Show, see a show of hands? See a lot of hands. When somebody says, where are you from? Are you from Cleveland? Are you from Cleveland? And it's just the same difference of your attitude and your position because the hardest thing to change is an attitude. And the worst group that we have in the entire United States about probably Northeastern Ohio are Northeastern Ohioans. Mm -hmm. uh, because we don't sell our own story with the same enthusiasm that you'd sell a product or a person or anything else. So I think that's the second thing that we have to do. We have to be committed in our heart that we're coming back uh, in, in, in this way. And I think we are. And then the, the, uh, uh, the third element is just simple stuff. Uh, one, of the, one of the gentlemen that sat next to me in, uh, uh, in a church a few pews away was head of, of uh, the folks at Phillips Electronics up the top of the hill. And I said to some of my colleagues, Phillips, and they said, well, what is that? And I said, well, they're only about as big as General Electric, and they're a pretty good sized organization. We just need to make sure we, we, we communicate with them. And so I said, why aren't you in the medical mart? You got you build some of the top MRI equipment in the entire world. You have 1,100 employees at Highland Heights. You're one of the biggest employers, and you st stay low key. Well, nobody asked. Well, it seems to me we need to ask. We need to make the out. We need to be an outreach group. Going on with the conversation, I said, what do we need to do to get you to commit more to Northeastern Ohio? You need to be asked. Within the first year and a half, they shut down their R&D lab in Sausalito, California, moved all 100 jobs at $100,000 plus per job to Highland Heights. I will take credit for having have a conversation. The other team, need, the rest of the team, need to execute on it. But I think that that's part of the part of it. We all need to be asking. We need to be making. We need to be closing that loop and saying, what does it take? Because right now. Zimmer, Stryker, all those folks are building those knees and hip joints over in Wausau, Indiana. You're going to see Jack Schron in Wausau, Indiana, asking him, put a call center here, put a tech center here, put, your plant, put a piece of your plant here, because Phillips installed $30 million worth of equipment at UH, or actually 35, because I was just, uh, uh, Mr. Zenti reminded me of the exact number yesterday. Um, oh, what's $5 million? What's $5 million? It's a big number. <laughs> uh, but uh, we, all we have to do is say that come to the, the uh, Global Center for Health Innovation. Put your kiosk there. Be part of it. Have your folks come. See the installation at UH. See that we're doing things at the Veterans Hospital, no, no, no place else in the world. I think that that's part of it. We have to be salespersons. Uh, I get along very well with the mayor. I don't see that as being something he probably likes to do, I think we could be a complementary team of uh, the two of us, one being outgoing, one being a little, a little more reserved. One more aspect of the question that was asked was immigration, was a attracting people from outside the country here. There's been a long-standing discussion about that in Cleveland in particular and in, in the region at large. You mentioned Mayor Jackson. He comes under some criticism for saying, let's take care of our own and then worry about the immigration issue. Others believe it's a, a way to have a robust community to replace population, uh, to bring in ideas. And I wonder what your thoughts are on attracting immigrants okay. to Northeast Ohio. My, my grandfather came from Hungary, and so he was a, uh, my, my mom was first generation. Uh, and so I am pretty well committed to uh, the, the idea and the concept that this community was growing on, on the strength of, of immigrants coming here. We gave them a reason to be here. Uh, we need to foster that. Uh, I know that. Uh, the Global Cleveland has, uh, has an objective uh, to throw out a big tent and to be inclusive and, uh, because we have gaps and we have a lot of gaps here in workforce and development and training and expertise. Uh, wouldn't we love to have some of those engineers uh, from India, the engineers from China, come here and be part of our global community? And so uh, I think that, uh, uh, yes, you want to make sure. I don't think those are mutually exclusive. It doesn't say that because I want to encourage uh, the filling of those technology and skills gaps uh, through uh, encouraging immigrants to come here means that I have to disregard other parts of our community. I don't think you can. You, we, have to, we have to make sure we're doing both because if an immigrant comes here and sees that we're not taking care of our, those folks who are in, in need, they're not going to want to be here either. So we have to make sure we're, we're, we're addressing both aspects of it. Next question. <coughs> 
Jack, uh, right now the uh, city, uh, the county council is eight Democrats and three Republicans, so you're in a kind of a comfortable minority there. But if you become the chief executive, you're going to be facing presumably a strong Democratic majority. How do you expect to get things done in that political configuration? Well, uh, I think it's, uh, I don't want to sound overly confident, but, uh, well, actually, the, 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 when we were early on in the game, uh, before we had actually selected leadership, I said, I think I should be the vice president. Uh, and knowing that eight's probably bigger than three, I knew that probably wasn't going to happen. But it did set the tone. I wanted to say that I didn't come to, to count hubcaps or, you know, just to watch the, the, the snow melt. And so I had conversations with the leadership, and they were very receptive. Uh, I, I think that uh, if, if you want to look at anything of the most success that we have as a county on this new form of charter government, it's the 11 of us work well together, we coordinate, we operate. I mean, we're going to take votes that are not in agreement, but I almost can guarantee you, if you go back and look at the last three and a half years worth of voting, and you read the issue, you won't be able to pick out where the 11 of us were voting on most of those issues unless you went back to the record and see, because we are on all sides of the issues. Uh, we are discussing it ecumenically. We're actually having great conversations. Uh, sometimes the other side's wrong, but that's okay. We'll fix that. No, no, just in seriousness, uh, we don't have any right or wrong. That's the good news about it. We just have differences of, point of opinion, and uh, even on, uh, on issues that, uh, that come up uh, that uh, are controversial, we still walk away and shake hands, and uh, Dan Brady and I, uh, he, he, he and I have become uh, good friends. I think almost uh, to the, I want to say the Tip O'Neill and, and Ronald Reagan type, uh, but we've got a, a, a very positive collegial uh, background. I don't think that it would be any resistance whatsoever of the two of us work, uh, of the, the council and uh, an executive uh, from a different party working together. Another reason why we shouldn't even have parties up there at that point anyway. You, you'd be Reagan in that re relationship? Uh, uh, yeah, I, well, I, I would hope that uh, I'd be the executive as opposed to the, the legislator. Uh, what about the way, <laughs> what about the way council, uh, council works now with the executive? And you mentioned some of the collegiality that you have, but uh, is, is county council a good checks and balance, or is it, uh, since it agrees so often with what's being put forward, essentially a rubber stamp? Oh, no, we're definitely not a rubber stamp. I think you can tell that uh, by the way we push back on issues and, and, and some things that uh, even on uh, where, where there might even be some, some votes that uh, you want to put forth to, uh, to make, they're strictly those feel-good votes uh, out there. Uh, we're not even bringing those up. They, they started the first, first year, everybody said, this is crazy. We don't want to waste our time, the community's time, to have those votes. What do you think about uh, you know, an, an initiative in Washington, D.C.? Uh, legislators sometimes get, get into that. We skipped all that step uh, out there. Uh, as far as the current executive and, and council leadership, that's, uh, that's another subject. I'm, I'll stay away from that one. Okay. Next question, sir. Yes, Jack. Hi, Patrick McLaughlin. Over the generations, Cuyahoga County has sent large numbers of its men and now women off to military service, particularly in time of war. Now uh, our veterans or servicemen and women are coming back to Cuyahoga County. Many of them are uh, hurting. They have problems and difficulties. And as county executive of this county, what, what can you do to aid their transition back to this community? And this was not a setup question. Uh, trust me on this, but it's one of my it's one of my beliefs that I, w I do intend to introduce, and that is that we have set asides now for county contracting in the areas of uh, minority business, female business, um, small business. I truly believe that we should have a set aside for those who have given the most to this country and have made them the highest dedication, those own business owners who are coming as veterans, and I think we should do, I would be prepared to do that as a county executive. It's one of my first steps, is just do a set aside that says our contracting for things like this convention center, like the hotel, should be part of that. But that's only a, that's only a small step. We need to be encouraging and finding things like um, housing support. We need to be finding things like uh, the, uh, uh, the way we, which, which we handled, we actually did the thing to push back and, and change some state law in regards to uh, the, the Veterans Service Commission. We had excess funds come back. Uh, in the past, they just rolled into the general fund. 
We said, let's stop that. These monies were intended for veterans. They were designed for veterans. They were set aside for veterans. It's in the state charter that these dollars come in there. And so we created special veterans programs on a yearly basis to identify that. And that was, again, that was a council-driven thing. That was not driven by the executive office. The, the executive supported it, but it was, it was council-driven. And so now we have particular items. One of the items that I, I am convinced all my colleagues to do uh, is that is that we should be using some of those dollars in the future to build a Fisher House and we should be putting those monies in there. We are the only major veterans hospital in the country that doesn't have a Fisher House sitting next to it. Next question, sir. Good afternoon, Councilman. Uh, my name is Ron O'Leary. I'm the assistant director with the Cleveland Building Department. Um, over the last eight years, the city has torn down over 7,000 structures and it's cost us about $60 million. It's mainly to, to eliminate blight, but it does set the table for future development. I wanted to ask you your thoughts on the proposal that the county executive put forth at the State of the County speech a few weeks ago about the $50 million demolition bond. Well, anytime you uh, demolish property, as, as you're probably on, on the inside of this information, there's a balancing act between tearing down the blight, because uh, I work uh, with the folks on, on, the, on that directly, because I'm looking at uh, putting the Fisher House uh, on a piece of property that, that's been reclaimed out of that s same situation out there. Uh, you, you have the neighbors uh, that say, tear the house down because it's blighted, it's in my neighborhood. Those who say, fix the house up because it, it shows another gap in our, in our community that might never get filled. And I'm sure you wrestle with that balancing act out there. Uh, at this point, I think that the, the conversation makes a lot of sense. I want to be part of it. I want to make sure uh, this is $50 million that has to be repaid. Uh, this is a $50 million uh, note that the county is being asked to put on. And unlike the $100 million fund, those are actual loans that are being repaid by borrowers. This is money uh, that will, as I understand the program, uh, will not be repaid. It's going to come out of our uh, bonding, so it's just going to mean that we're going to be paying for it over a long period of time. There's there's value in, in obviously, we, right now we put in $7 million uh, into uh, the rehab right now out of our county budget. He's asking us to put another $50 million in. I think that uh, it has not been presented to council. Uh, it is, we don't have it on our table. It was one of these big picture items that has not come come to us directly. We Just like the $100 million fund and the Western Reserve Fund came to us as one of these kind of concepts without any meat and bones on it, it's our job uh, to see whether it has merit, how we're going to pay for it. We're going to borrow this. 50, this is going to be $50 million worth of bond notes. And, uh, and then what's, what, what are we going to be doing to, to make sure? It, it, I, I don't want to see things being done for flash in the pan. I want to see things being done for legitimate long term. Yes, ma'am. Hi, Mr. Schron. My name is Jessica Columbi. Um, I, too, am left of center and uh, sometimes claim being a Democrat. But I'm a little tired of all of the partisan stuff, which is why I so much appreciate your language. Um, and your, really, your authenticity and your candor uh, is so unlike um, so many of the typical politicians that I've spent time with. So I really appreciate that you're bringing that to the table. Um, I am studying uh, change management and organizational behavior, so I also have a particular interest in your candidacy because of your management experience, and I think that's an underrated quality for people that we elect, so I'm excited about that part of your candidacy. Um, I want to get a little less heady and a little more visceral. I'm interested, you said you're doing this because after having spent all of this time in the private sector and now some time as a councilman, um, you've sp you, you were doing this because the job hasn't been done, but I'm wondering what really is driving you. Um, at, you know, why are you doing this? <laughs> and uh, also, if you could say a few words about your relationship with CMSD. What the heck were you thinking? I think, <laughs> <laughs> um, I think, I think what I was thinking is that I really uh, don't believe the job is finished. I do believe that we need to have an executive uh, at that, uh, I mean, kind of crazy county executive. So I think we, th that, that is the driving word, and I want to be part of that. And I want to finish it because I think I can make a difference uh, out there. Uh, I think that uh, uh, when we look at it, and let's just, just a, as a mini example, uh, the other day when we were doing budgets, uh, the other day, 
November, man. Um, uh, the uh, uh, November we were doing budgets and we had three people testifying uh, and all three were testifying about the heroin problem. One division, another department, another department. And I asked, well that was, that's, I, I understand the problem of, of that heroin is, is, is an epidemic. Uh, the black community, the African American community has experienced it for years. It's now coming out of the suburbs. Everybody's getting a, a wake up moment finally about the, the problem. And I asked the first person, did you talk to the second? The second person, you talked to the third, the third to the second, and they said no, they hadn't. And yet, what I'm talking about as far as reorganizing, this is what needs to be done. We need to, to, to get these, what were previously silos. I mean, and it's simple, it's not simple. This is a very complicated thing. How do we even drive the software that's going to be driving our business and how we do the operational piece? We're, using a, we're actually using a flip phone to, to do most of our county business concept and we need to move into the iPhone te techniques. And, uh, I mean, that's just as an analogy of where we are. And so that's what I want to want to bring to the table as far as that concept of, of moving forward and doing management into your CMSD. Um, I'm very committed to, to Cleveland Municipal School Districts. Uh, not only are, am I committed, uh, I've got the Jack Schron Scholarship in my father's name that we actually scholarship three students last year at Max Hayes, the last vocational high school in town. I personally deliver those, uh, those checks to the, the, uh, the individuals who win uh, the scholarships and we follow their careers all the way on through. Uh, Cleveland Municipal School District is, uh, is on the edge, I think, of, of, of pulling itself up. Uh, uh, I was actually did a commercial with my chief, financial, or chief political advisor, uh, Senator George Voinovich, uh, last year for the, the levy. Uh, that levy my, my CFO is probably not thrilled about this, but it cost Juergens money uh, because our property values are going to go up, but it was the right thing to do to have the Cleveland Municipal School District get that levy in place for those kids and for those students. Flip phones, huh? Well, I think that's where we are. We need to move away from that. How are those dot matrix printers doing? Uh, they're doing, it, it's, it's actually those blue fax machines. You remember those things? Or blue, blue, last, maybe, maybe rough, we're yeah. going to take the last question now. Go right ahead, sir. It's for Burke Lakefront Airport to be updated or changed around. It's been sitting there for a million years. Any plans in the growth of Cleveland for that area? And the opposite question often gets asked, not updated, but bulldozed. Well, uh, obviously you have the Miggs Field uh, technique, which uh, was used up there in Chicago, but uh, we don't quite have that situation because unlike Chicago, they were still taking federal money. We were taking federal money here. They stopped 20 years before uh, to, to, in the interest of time. The first step uh, of moving along the lakefront development, because I'll just take it as a lakefront development question more than just uh, the, the airport. We have first phase of East Bank of the Flats was something that we were all involved with, and that's the first phase has been done. It was so successful with Ernst & Young moving in there, Tucker Ellison moving in there, uh, the new hotel, all the top restaurants, that phase two is going in place. Uh, that now is going to connect, I guess I'll do it visually for you, uh, is now going to connect us up to the lake and now we're coming down the river, we're coming across the lake. The next section that has already been put in place is all of the, the property north of the stadium is being taken out and the north of the stadium is where you see the development going in place there. Then you come down to the harbor and the harbor is the next phase of the development and then of course right next to the harbor is Burke Lake Front. Um, it, this is a, a 30 year uh, 40 years have been sitting idle. We are got, we've got the steps moving along. I would like to see that we actually finish the steps as we, as we continue this process. Ladies and gentlemen, you've been listening to a conversation with Jack Schron. <laughs> and Jack, I want to I thank you for please, a great please, a round of applause for our moderator, Mike McIntyre. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Anyone seeking news about the county's prospects for the RNC should see uh, Rob Frost. <laughs>